Well, if you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Turn with me to the book of Micah. We're going to start uh, and end in the heart of the book. Uh, Micah chapter 6, verses 6, 7, and 8. So find the book of Micah and chapter 6, verse 6, 7, and 8. I want to tell you just a little bit about this book and a little bit about Micah. We'll talk some here this morning about uh, this prophecy. Micah was written in the 8th century, and it's set in a context when Israel was undergoing an enormous amount of dissonance and pressure um, internally, what was going on in their own area, what was going around in their own towns, what was going around in their own, what was going on in their own hearts. And they were experiencing a whole lot of oppression, what was going on around them, outside of them. There's some really heavy dynamics at work that are happening here. They're dealing with these sort of unexpected foreign powers that are pressing in on them. And they're dealing with these visions and prophecies that are coming at them by these prophets like Amos and Isaiah and others. And in some sense, their experience with God has become disoriented. Like, what do we do? Like, what's going on? What, where, we, where do we go here? They're not sure what to do. Uh, they're not sure what to make of all that's going on around them. It's affecting what's going on inside of them. And for some of the people of Israel, they've just given up hope. They've just given up hope. It's just so overwhelming. And these verses here in the middle of the book where we're going to start this morning, I, I believe that they're meant to settle these people. They're meant to just kind of bring some space to understand to hear god and to go oh okay 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 god okay okay these verses i think are just to help stabilize the people of israel but they're also meant to give a vision a picture of how to live and how to love not just the right way not just the moral way but this picture of how to live and how to love that actually reflects god's character that's really what God wants, is for us to reflect his character in our own lives and into the lives of the people around us. So there's a couple of memorable portions of Micah, but some of you might know these verses, Micah chapter 6, probably the best known verses in this book. It says this, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give up my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice... And to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is so generous of God. It's so good of God. He sees all that's going on. He understands all that's happening. He knows where they are. He knows how far they've fallen into their own sin patterns. He knows how much they've given up. And he knows about the abuse and he knows about the injustice and he says, I see where you are, and I see how you are, and this is what I want you to do. Well, he actually starts by saying, this is what I don't want you to do. And then he says, this is what I want you to do. And it's really not about these specific, dramatic acts of worship, God says. Um, they're sort of saying, you know, should we bring our burnt offerings, these year-old calves? That would be like the best of their offerings, uh, they express their worship, the worshipers' sort of total dependence or dedication uh, from Leviticus chapter 9. Uh, that's where they were called to bring burnt offerings. Or should we bring extravagant amounts of oil? That's what King Solomon did. Brought all this oil, 1 Kings 3 and chapter 8. Or, or maybe, the, maybe should we bring the ultimate sacrifice? Should we bring the firstborn son? And God says, no, that's not what I want. I don't want all of that. I don't need all of that. I'm after something more plain, actually. I'm after something more fundamental than any of those things. I'm after these three things, justice, kindness, and the humility to walk 
with God. As always, around here, I want to invite you to find yourself in the story that we're going to talk about today. I want to invite you to allow these truths of old, maybe they're old truths for you, or maybe these are new truths, but I just want to invite you to allow these truths to speak to you, to allow God's word to recenter you, maybe to refocus you, maybe to stabilize you, maybe to help you find your footing on what it is that God wants. Like the Israelites, there may be some of you who are dealing with some unexpected opposition. There may be things that are going on in your life. Maybe it's not foreign powers coming after you, but maybe there are pressures from the outside world that are just weighing you down. Or maybe like the Israelites, the cares of this world, or maybe even the call from God has been kind of disorienting and you're struggling like, what do I do with this? Where do I go with this? Maybe it's some stuff that you've held on really tightly for a long, long time, and God is inviting you, let that go, let it go, let it go. Trust me, you can trust me. And maybe like the people of Israel, you're not sure where to go. You're not sure what to do. You're not sure what to make of all that's going on around you, or maybe all that's going on inside of you. And maybe even like the Israelites, some of you have given up hope. This message of Micah is for you. Just as much as it is for the Israelites, this message is for you, and it's for me. So let's back up. Uh, Micah's name means, who is like Yahweh? What a great name. Who is like Yahweh? Uh, His whole life is going to point back to God. It's going to point back to Yahweh Um, The name Yahweh uh, uh, was super familiar to the Israelites. It actually occurs 6,800 times in the Old Testament. Yahweh is a name that would be very familiar to these guys. So when Micah shows up and his name means who is like Yahweh, everyone is going to think of God. Everyone is going to think of this man as representing God himself. Yahweh is the name of God that is most clearly linked to the redeeming acts of God in history. So Micah, I'll let Micah introduce himself. If you have your Bibles and you want to flip over to Micah chapter 3, verse 8, he introduces himself here. He says, uh, but for me, I'm filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. He has a job description, he knows his job description, and he's going to make sure the people that he's speaking to knows his job description. The book of Micah, if you read the whole thing, it reads a little bit like poetry. The book of Amos is like kind of hardcore preaching, if you will. Uh, When we read Amos last week, you just sort of these stinging, really hard, uh, maybe even biting comments. Micah's book isn't like that. It's a bit more like poetry. Flip over to the very first uh, verses of the book. I want you to hear this. Though it's like poetry, it doesn't hold back when it comes to describing God's coming judgment. Like the other prophets, the other minor prophets, Micah's going to speak out against the sin of God's people, and he's going to call God's people to come back to him, to repent and come back to him. One of the coolest parts about the book of Micah at least from my perspective, is that with every uh, prophecy of judgment, there's a corresponding prophecy of hope. There's a really powerful theology of hope in the book of Micah. Amidst real judgment, amidst God saying some really, really strong things, there's this beautiful picture of hope in Micah. So here's a bit of the first prophecy of judgment uh, because of Israel's disobedience. Micah chapter 1, uh, verses 2 through 5. Here, you peoples, all of you, pay attention, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains will melt under him, and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down 
a steep place. All this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. What is the transgressions of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? And what is the high place of Judah? Is it not Jerusalem? Micah's going to talk a little bit more about this in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Basically, he's calling out 500 years of rebellion and disobedience. And because of this disobedience, these people are going to be overtaken by their enemies. First, it's going to be the Assyrians that are going to come, and then the Babylonians are going to come, and they're going to take some of God's people into exile. Flip over to chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. He's going to keep going this prophecy of judgment. Woe to those who plan iniquity, to those who plot evil on their beds. At morning's light, they carry it out because it, because it is in their power to do it. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them. They defraud people of their homes. They rob them of their inheritance. Therefore, the Lord says, I am planning disaster against this people from which you cannot save yourselves. You will no longer walk proudly for it will be a time of calamity. And in that day, people will ridicule you. They will taunt you with this mournful song. We are utterly ruined. My people's possessions is divided up. He takes it from me. He assigns our fields to traitors. Therefore, you will have no one in the assembly of the Lord to divide the land by lot. The people of Israel were taking land from poor people, their own poor people, and they were assigning it to wealthy people. And this is one of those things where God is saying, this is not okay. It is not okay for you to mistreat the poor. And then Micah is going to spend the next few verses kind of picking fights with the prophets, the prophets who were willing to offer promises to anyone who would pay them just the right amount of money. But then in the last couple of verses uh, come, this uh, come, come this beautiful, these beautiful words of hope. So after all of this judgment, after all that he's going to do, I will surely gather all of you, Jacob, I'll surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I'll bring them together like a sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men. And he who opens the breach goes up before them. They break through the pass of the gate, going out by it. Their king passes on before them, the Lord at their head. I don't know if you caught that, but God's going to hold on to this little remnant. All of this is going to happen. All this judgment's going to happen. The oppression's going to happen. The Assyrians are coming. The Babylonians are going to come on. But God's going to hold on to this little remnant. Not everyone in Israel has been disobedient. And through this little remnant, God's going to rebuild Israel. Through this little group of people, this little remnant, all nations are going to know the God of Yahweh. Chapter 3 and 4, Micah is going to talk some more about judgment. Basically, he's going to call the people of Israel out for their complicity to injustice. Judgment is coming because of grave injustice, he says. They were bending justice to favor the wealthy. Kind of like what Amos, Amos was saying, as we read last Sunday, they were abusing the poor, dehumanizing the poor. I want you to hear how Micah puts it. He says it this way, uh, chapter 3, verse 1. Listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, I will gather the remnant of... Oh, sorry, that's, uh, that's chapter... That's verse 12. Let's go on to the next one. I think it's chapter 3, verse 1. There we go. And I said, Hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin off my people and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off of them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Okay, real quick. Who is God talking to here? To Israel. So for us, who is God talking to here? He's talking to the church. 
And he's saying to the church, hold on. Look at what you guys are doing. This is not okay. This is not okay. And there's this really crazy language. And he's saying, disaster is coming your way because of all of this. Here's chapter, uh, the end of chapter 3, uh, verse 9 down through verse 12. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Her leaders judge for a bribe. Her priests teach for a price. And her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. The temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. Why is God so strong here? Because God takes sin so seriously here. Okay, let me pause. How are you guys doing? You guys with me? Okay, let me just pause real quick. So our family has, we have a family group chat. Like most families, we have a family group chat, and we all text in this family group chat. And our younger daughter, AGB, she uh, does this thing where she says, morale check. So she'll put it in the text group chat. She'll say, morale check, and then she'll say where she is. She'll go, six out of ten. And then my beloved, will, she'll text in to the group chat, seven out of ten, or... My older daughter, she'll be like, oh man, this is a terrible day, three out of 10, you know. Uh, we all just, every so once in a while, uh, AGB knows kind of what's going on and she'll morale check. So let's just say you're the Israelites and you're hearing this message and God does this text message to you and he goes, okay, Israel, morale check. How are you? Where are you? What would you, what would be your number here if you're Israel and you're hearing this? You could just tell the person sitting next to you. Uh, four out of ten, you're feeling pretty good, you're feeling pretty heavy, is this really hard? Yeah. Okay, forget the Israelites, let's just talk about ourselves. <laughs> Morale check. You're hearing this, you know your life, you know your story, you know where you are better than anyone else. I won't ask you to tell the person sitting next to you your answer. Morale check. Thank goodness we're not left alone in our sin and disobedience. Thank goodness. Praise God that he loves us enough not to leave us in our sin and shame. Praise God that he comes for us, he comes to us, he comes to free us, to change us, to lead us, and to love us. And he does the same for the Israelites uh, the temple, Israel, it won't be ruined forever. Check out chapter 4, verses uh, 1 through 4. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. And it shall be lifted above all the hills, and peoples will flow to it. And many nations will come, and they'll say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge between many peoples, and he'll decide disputes for strong nations far away, and they'll beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, and nations shall not lift up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Powerful words of hope. So powerful. In fact, um, maybe if you want to, this is an aside, but maybe if you want to later on this afternoon, you could read Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2, 3, and 4, because it says the exact same thing. Isaiah says the exact same thing that Micah says. The passages are absolutely identical. I, I don't know if Isaiah said it first or Micah said it first or how it happened, but these guys are saying the same message. Ultimately, it's God that are speaking. It's God that is speaking to us. These words I find so hope-filled, especially these last lines. In fact, um, this is just going to get crazy for a minute, so hold tight. We used to sing. We used to sing 
these truths. I don't know if any of you uh, recognize those lines, but when we were at summer camp, we used to sing these lines. Uh, Tony, would you just put the last, that last screen back up, the very last one, where they will train for war, they won't train for war anymore. How does it go? Yeah. Nor will they train for war anymore. We used to sing that when we were kids at camp. Any of you know this song? If you know this song, we're going to give it a try. Stay with me. If, we, if you know this song, uh, we just, just want you to sing it with me. I'm going to lay down my burdens down by the riverside. Down by the riverside, down by the riverside, I'm going to lay down my burdens. Down by the riverside, going to study war no more. Ready? Here we go. Going to study war no more. Study war no more. Study war no more. Going to study war no more. Study war no more. Study war no more. All right. Now we're going to do it again. Just kidding. No, we're not going to do it again. This stuff is so true that it became the songbook of the church. I'm going to lay down my burdens. I'm going to lay them down because one day he's coming. One day he's coming. Not going to fight anymore. No more wars. One day there'll be no more wars. There'll be no more rumors of wars. One day he'll take all things to himself. One day, one day. Morale check. Now how are you doing? Morale check. Feeling a little bit better? One day, one day, yes. Micah says that the ruined temple in Jerusalem won't be permanent. That God will one day exalt his temple. He'll fill it with his presence and fill the city with the remnant of his people. God's purpose is to make Israel the meeting place of heaven and earth, and it will be fulfilled, and all nations will stream to Jerusalem. Will God will become their king and bring peace to all the earth. Verse 6, in that day, declares the Lord, I love this, in that day, declares the Lord, I will assemble the lame and gather those who have been driven away and those whom I have afflicted, and the lame I will make the remnant. And those who were cast off, I will make them a strong nation, and the Lord will reign over them in Mount Zion from this time forth and forevermore. Amen. In the next few verses, we learn that the Assyrian attack is coming and Israel is going to be exiled to Babylon, but eventually God will restore his people and bring them back to their land. And then comes some really, really good news. If you have your Bibles, uh, listen to Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 6. This might sound familiar to some of you, but you, Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, out of you who will come for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient days. And therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth, and then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel, and he will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. And when the Assyrians come into our land and treads in our palaces, then we'll raise against him seven shepherds and eight princes of men, and they'll shepherd the land of Assyria with the sword and the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and he'll deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and treads within our borders. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Does that sound hopeful? Uh, does anybody recognize this prophecy of Jesus coming from Bethlehem? In uh, Matthew's Gospel, he tells this beautiful story of the uh, birth of Jesus, and he talks about the time where King Herod is like freaking out because the Magi have come from the east, and they want to know where is the Messiah going to be born, and these guys quote Micah. So crazy. So this is Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 4, 5, and 6. When he called all the peoples together, uh, that's King Herod. When he called all the peoples together, all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born, and they quote Micah, in Bethlehem, in Judea, for this will, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. 
just want you to just want to read uh, verse 4 and 5 from Micah one more time. And he will stand and shepherd his flock. And he'll do it in the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they will live securely, for that his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. One day, Messiah will come. And when he comes, he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Paul writes to the church at Rome, one day, one day, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Paul writes to the church at Corinth, Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. 2 Thessalonians 3.16, some of you might remember this one. Now, may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. And then the last few verses to the letter of the Hebrews says this. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is a, maybe a little bit of a bummer, but they had to wait 700 years. 700 years. Man, I'm up terrible waiter i just don't wait well these guys had to wait 700 years for this prophecy 40 times in the songbook of israel the psalms there would be this idea of waiting in hope not waiting in fear, not waiting in anxiety, but waiting in hope. This is just one example. Probably my favorite example comes from Psalm 33, verses 20 through 22. The Israelites would have hung on to these promises. They would have sung these promises. We wait in hope. Our soul waits for the Lord, for he is our help and our shield. Our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us O oh Lord even as we put our hope in you how do we wait what do we wait for we wait for a circumstance we wait for a cure we wait for money to come in we wait for a new job we wait what are we waiting for we're waiting for him may your unfailing love be with us O oh Lord even as we put our hope in you and then Jesus finally does come when he does come he says these words peace i leave with you my peace the god of peace my peace i give you i do not give as the world gives don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid jesus is the god of peace and he has given his peace and his presence to you and me. The end of Micah ends with hope. Uh, if you have your Bibles, flip to the very end of the book, Micah chapter 7. This is verses 18, 19, and 20. Micah 7, 18, 19, and 20. Who is a God like you? <laughs> wow. Who is a God like you? Who pardons sin and forgives the transgressions of the remnant of his inheritance? He does not hold his anger forever because he delights to show mercy. He will, again, have compassion on us, will tread our iniquities underfoot, will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea, will be faithful to Jacob and to show love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers in days long ago. We are not 
going to put our hope in a specific outcome. We are going to put our hope in two places. The first is in God's character. Who is like you? Is there anyone like you? We put our hope in his character. Who is like you? Verse 18. And secondly, we put our hope in God's promise. God will be faithful to his promise. Verse 20. Our hope is in his character and in his promise. He will be faithful. We too wait for the coming of the Lord. We too wait for redemption and renewal and the resurrection of all things. We too wait. How do we wait? What do we do when we're overwhelmed or persecuted or when it feels like the enemy is winning? What do we think about? How do we act? How do we love? Well, he has told you, friends, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justice love kindness and to walk humbly with your God regardless of the story regardless of the circumstance regardless of the, pray, the, the pain or the sickness or the debt or the brokenness or the failure or the betrayal regardless, regardless of the uncertainty we're called to do justice to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. For this is the way of Jesus. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the way that you deal with us. You do not deal with us in a manner in which our sins deserve. You move toward us. God, thank you for your tenderness and your compassion and your kindness that leads us to repentance. And thank you, God, that you will never leave us, that you will never forsake us, that you will always walk with us, never leaving us totally alone or leaving us to our own devices. God, thank you for walking with us. You are Emmanuel, God with us. You, Jesus, are the God of peace. May we rest in your peace today. In Jesus' name.